Okay, let's talk about water quality. One of the things that will limit growth in Colorado more than anything else is water. Uh, that will control the population of Colorado. Um, if you have the opportunity to take any uh, ag, ag law classes from uh, Department of Ag and Resource Economics, uh, you'll spend a little bit of time on water law. We have law offices in Colorado that do nothing but uh, work on law. Uh, it's also one of the major factors in a greenhouse that influences your crop productivity. Uh, for instance, when we were at Welby Gardens, Welby is a very dry grower, and a, when you get uh, to where you can identify a crop fairly well, when you have some experience, I walk in there and I can see that most of the plants are just about wilted. And they do that on purpose to make sure that those plants are hardy and strong to go out into the environment for the landscape contractor. In addition to the water volume, water quality is just as important as the quantity and probably just maybe even more important in a greenhouse. So greenhouse growers get their water from three main sources. First one is an agricultural well. Uh, agricultural wells are very common in Colorado, very common throughout the United States. Most of the agricultural wells in Colorado are fairly shallow, especially along the Platte River Valley. Um, which means their water quality is not very good. You go down to the San Luis Valley, um, those wells are as many as 12 to 1400 feet deep, and those aquifers are actually hot. The water comes out of the ground at about 180 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, do those greenhouses save money on heating? Exactly. Exactly. They do. They use that ground water to heat their greenhouses and they have no heating bill. Exactly. And in fact, um, there's an alligator farm down there that's up for sale if you want to buy an alligator farm. They take the hot water out of the ground and they heat it for their alligators. Is that and it's by the sand dunes? It's by the sand dunes, on the way to the sand dunes. It's for sale. I saw the for sale sign last, I was there weekend before last. So. Um, are there many other geothermal hotspots like that? Are there geothermal hotspots like that? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, the primary ones in Colorado, uh, like I said, in San Luis Valley, in the Salida area, there's a few, and over in the Durango area, there's a few. Uh, Glenwood Springs, of course, um, and there's some in Idaho. They're, they're all over the country. And if you can tap into those geothermal facilities and use that heat, um, that's a major cost savings. Um, the, one of the issues with the water in the San Luis Valley, that's a closed um, aquifer. It's, it's, very, it's, it's very old. It doesn't, um, doesn't replenish itself. Um, and because it's a closed aquifer, it's got some contaminants. For instance, um, one of the contaminants that the greenhouse grower has to deal with is colloidal gold. Now, I don't really understand what that is, other than it clogs the filters up real bad, and you can't get the gold out because it's not worth anything. But um, uh, the chemistry teacher is going to figure that out for me. Colloidal gold. Most of the, a lot of the water in Colorado is surface water, surface irrigation from canals or reservoirs. Um, typically speaking, what that means, if you're going to um, take your water from a canal or, or reservoir, you have to own the rights to that water. Uh, one of the problems with that water is oftentimes it's gone through a field and come off of a field and the water quality is not going to be the best. Uh, for instance, the canal, um, the ditch water in Grand Junction is fairly uh, fairly saline. I was involved with a uh, litigation a couple of years ago with a greenhouse outside of Newcastle where they had ditch water that was very, very clean. Uh, Newcastle is just outside of Glenwood Springs. The greenhouse operation was 150, 200 yards off the Colorado River. Well, they're getting their water from ditch water out of the mountains, which was absolutely crystal clear and pure, and the city of Newcastle decided to swap the water right with Colorado River water at that point, and the water quality differences are very different. So uh, it was a fairly uh, brutal lit litigation, but uh, they kept their water right. Uh, but the surface irrigation, canals, reservoirs, um, typically we refer to that as ditch water. 
Then there's municipal providers. Now the municipal provider, it could be either well water or surface water. For instance, the, uh, the water in Fort Collins is surface water. It actually comes um, either out of the Poudre River or out of horse tooth, and the water that comes out of horse tooth is actually Colorado River water from the headwaters on the other side of the Continental Divide. That's why our water is so near perfect. It kind of drives me crazy from people buy bottled water in Colorado. It comes from a bottling plant in Wyoming when we have the perfect water out of the drinking fountain. So, um, could be well water, could be surface water. For instance, if you're, a, if you're a greenhouse grower in the Fort Collins area like Jordan's, you're pretty confident that your water is coming from one source, it's coming from the Poudre River. We had to swap uh, during the, the High Park fire because uh, the water quality was degraded with runoff. But in the city of Denver, there are many reservoirs that that city, the Denver water taps off of. And the water quality changes based on the parent material where the runoff is going to that reservoir. So your electrical conductivity or your pH or your base salts could change overnight. And Denver water is not going to tell you when they change reservoir for your part of town. So growers like Welby's are constantly testing their water to be aware of how the water quality is changing. Tagawa's, they're on a shallow well. Their well is about 35 feet deep and it's got high saline levels and they have to use reverse osmosis to clean the salts out of that water. Okay. In addition to that, which not many people know, is one of their neighbors has a bad septic system and they have to chlorinate their water just for the health of their employees so the employees don't get sick. So, so when you're talking about water quality, we talk about alkalinity, salinity, pH, sodium absorption ratio, specific ions, and suspended solids. All of these things are critical for a greenhouse grower to understand with their water quality. When somebody calls me on the phone and says, I want to build a greenhouse, the first thing I ask them is, where is your water coming from? Most people say it comes from a pipe from the street. Well, how much are you going to pay for that? You know, there's domestic rate, there's a commercial rate, and there's an ag rate. We always want to try to get that ag rate, and usually it's classified as a dairy or something like that. Because a domestic rate, you're not going to afford that. But you also need to know, what is your water quality? So we measure alkalinity, and you'll do this in, in, in lab. I can't remember exactly when. We measure al alkalinity in terminology of mean equivalence of, per liter of carbonates and bicarbonates. Now you'll see some books, some textbooks, will refer to parts per million, carbonates and bicarbonates. It doesn't work. You need to think of milliequivalents. Do you know what a milliequivalent per liter is? Do you remember your freshman chemistry when you had to figure out molar, uh, molar values? A milliequivalent refers to a milliequivalent or a millimole. Right? So, and we're looking at the carbonates and bicarbonates. Now, if you do a agricultural water test, they're going to tell you how many milliequivalents of bicarbonates and carbonates you're going to have in your water. These are negatively charged anions. Um, if you send your water test to a, a, a health department laboratory, they're going to give you the hardness value. Okay, and the hardness value is the calcium carbonates. This is in reference to how much scrubbing you're going to have to do to get the calcium um, off the toilet bowl rim. Okay, I'm more interested in the dissolved carbonates and bicarbonates. Now, for most um, production, most greenhouse production, I want to have my mill equivalents of less than two. I can tolerate up to eight or nine or ten if I'm growing in nursery stock, large containers, but if I'm a plug grower or a pack grower, I need it to be less than two, because what happens over time is those carbonates are, are going to precipitate out in your potting soil. Okay? And what happens with it when it precipitates out of your potting soil, it forms basically limestone, jacks the pH up. 
okay? Raises the pH. And the smaller your volume, the smaller your volume of soil, the more likely the pH is to rise, okay? The next thing is salinity. Now, salinity is different than alkalinity. Alkalinity refers just to the anions carbonate and bicarbonate. Now, remember, everything in nature is balanced. For every anion, you have a cation. For every cation, you have an anion. So when you look at a laboratory report, the numbers don't usually equal in, in milliequivalents, and that's what you're referring to when the milliequivalents balance your charges. Okay? There's a lot of other stuff in there that the laboratory doesn't test, but if you tested for every single element in it, it would come out to be exactly the same number of positive equivalents and the exact same number of negative equivalents. Salinity refers to the dissolved solids or salts. Now, when you think of salt, the first thing that comes to your mind is table salt, right? Sodium chloride. Well, all dissolved solids are technically a salt. You know, it could be your, your nitrate fertilizer salts, your ammoniacal nitrogen fertilizer, your, your, your uh, potassium, uh, your um, phosphates. All those are dissolved. And the more salts you have dissolved in the solution, the higher your electrical conductivity goes up. Electrical conductivity, that we measure that, again, we'll, t we'll do this in lab, with an electrical conductivity meter, and we look at how well that solution passes an electrical charge. Now, if you were an engineer, you'd say, hey, that's not conductivity, that's resistance is what we're measuring. Well, resistance is an ohm, and conductivity is the inverse of an ohm, thus it's spelled backwards. We call it a mo. Well, the, the term that we're, the units we're using now is decisiemens per meter. And it's a unit of conductivity or, or how much, the, so the higher volume of salt in your solution, the more likely it is, or the better it is to conduct an electrical charge. So electrical conductivity, um, we're looking at, you know, if it's uh, 0.25 decisiemens per meter, um, that's virtually clean water, and that's actually where Fort Collins is in between point two is is right about 0.25. It's very very low. Um, 0.25 to 0.75 is is moderate, and actually, um, and then two to two and a quarter and higher is severe. The problem with this is, is if we're injecting a fertilizer, especially a conventional fertilizer that's salt-based, fertilizer salt-based, is we're going to be increasing the electrical conductivity just by adding that fertilizer. And it's an additive. You know, it adds on itself. So if we're putting in enough fertilizer into our system of 0.5 or higher, we're going to raise that electrical conductivity even, even higher. And what happens to the plant, when you think about the plant, is this modifies the osmo osmotic potential of your water. Okay? The higher the electrical conductivity, the lower the osmotic potential, more negative, and it draws water back. It can make You can actually physically wilt your plant by putting too much salt in your system. It draws on the osmotic potential. Okay? Uh, some meters that you can uh, will measure total dissolved solids uh, in parts per million, and that's a, a conversion fi factor of 700. But most of the meters that we use in the greenhouse industry are um, measuring in decisiemens per meter. Uh, you can buy a pocket handheld meter for about 150 bucks. That's what I use in laboratories and our laboratory exercises. Um, and most growers use a, especially one that's using a water hose, carries one in their pocket. Um, they put it in the water stream to make sure that they're getting, uh, it's a good check for making sure the fertilizer injectors are running. pH, pH of the water, pH is um, a reciprocal of the um, hydrogen ion concentration. Uh, we want water water in our greenhouses would be around 5.4 to 7. 
5.47. And in fact, in greenhouses, uh, you'll hear people asking about what the pH of the water is. In fact, I am of the philosophy that the pH is irrelevant. It's the alkalinity. And the alkalinity also refers to the buffering capacity. The more alkaline your water is, the higher the pH is going to be. Like if you have an alkaline water that's around 8 to 10 milliequivalents, you're going to have a uh, pH of about 8. You know, I, the, the alkalinity is more important to me to the pH. The water here in Fort Collins is slightly acid, but since it has virtually no salts in there, it has no buffering capacity. And if you look in Nelson's textbook, you'll see that he agrees with me, disagrees with me completely. All he talks about is pH. All we talk, all I talk about is alkalinity. Remember that Dr. Nelson wrote the textbook is from North Carolina. I'm from the West, so it's it's a different, different concept in water. When you're talking about your salts, we look at what's called the sodium absorption ratio. Because a lot of the fertilizer salts, a lot of the salts in the water are actually essential elements. And when you're designing a fertilizer program, it's very important that you look at all the elements that are in the fertilizer, because if nature's giving you some of those elements naturally, why add them to your fertilizer? However, there are some salts that come in our water that are not essential elements, and the primary one is sodium. Okay? And if you remember from um, your basic soils class, you can think about two-to-one lattice clay and how sodium deflocculates soil. Okay? Well, too much sodium in the soil also creates a problem with your osmotic potential and gives you salt burn. So one of the things we also look at in the greenhouse industry is a number we call the sodium absorption ratio. Now, the sodium absorption ratio needs to be less than 10. It needs to be less than 10. For most green, and, and that's for uh, at, a, at that's the maximum. Uh, nursery grower that's growing in gallons or three gallons or five gallon containers, they can handle ten to fifteen. But remember, you're growing in a small, small volume. So for plugs, I actually want my sodium absorption ratio in most greenhouse crops four or less. Also, if it's uh, the calcium is out of whack and the high sodium absorption ratio is based on calcium, it will precipitate out and clog your emitters. Now the hardness factor comes in. So we take the mole value of the sodium in milliequivalents and we divide it by the square root of the average of calcium and magnesium. Because calcium and magnesium are actually essential elements, right? Sodium is not. Now, there are some other factors involved, and I've, it's in some other handouts in the, in, the, in, in the website talking about what's called the adjusted sodium absorption ratio. And I, I decided not to present that in the class right now. But um, that takes into account the balance of calcium in there. But most of your laboratory analysis is going to give you your sodium absorption ratio. I've seen growers work with. Um, SAR values um, along the Platte River Valley, the water coming out of those shallow wells may have an SAR of 18 or 19. If you have an SAR, high SAR value, what might you do to offset that? I'm just, what would you do? Reverse osmosis. Reverse osmosis is probably the, that's the most expensive and the best choice, yes. To take those salts out, Okay. Exactly. Add calcium and magnesium. And what we do is we typically add calcium sulfate or Epsom salts, no, calcium sulfate or gypsum to the mix, to the potting soil, and that brings that SAR value down. And in fact, all, almost all the growers in Texas and all the growers along the Gulf Coast where they have high SAR water with, from saltwater intrusion, uh, we'll put gypsum in their potting soil. Magnesium, we add that as magnesium sulfate in our in the injection water, uh, and that 
helps keep that balance out. So, you know, one way is reverse osmosis. Another way is to, is to offset it with with some chemistry. But um, you can eventually add too much. Okay. All right. So water quality is more important or as important or more important than water quantity. Irrigation systems, um, we could teach a whole class on greenhouse irrigation systems and some of you in the landscape contracting um, are probably taking Alan Andale's uh, irrigation courses. But irrigation systems and greenhouses are uh, as complicated as you want to make them. Hand watering. Um, a lot of growers consider hand watering as being too expensive and too labor intensive. But I don't know if you noticed that most of the greenhouses that we're in did a lot of hand watering. And in fact, Welby greenhouses, Welby gardens, almost is essentially only hand watering. And their growers are the ones that are doing the watering. You don't want to put your lowest paid, untrained employee on the end of a water hose. Degawas, before they let an employee touch a water hose, they have to attend a class. I think uh, Chad talked a little bit about their uh, irrigation class. And what, it, what they do is an employee comes in and takes a class. Uh, the growers put together um, the um, photographs and images of where they want, when, when they want a specific plant watered. And then that is turned around, and the pedagogical structure of the classes was actually developed by a high school teacher who actually comes in and teaches the classes mostly in Spanish. So before uh, an individual even touches a water hose, they have to go through the training. Um, even growers that are using um, lots of um, automation will use hand watering as a touch up. The person on the water hose is, is probably one of the most important employees in the greenhouse because they're at your plant every day. And you want that grower to also do scouting, looking at the plant, looking to make sure everything's balanced. That's why you don't want to put the lowest paid employee on the end of the water hose. And of course, use a, a good breaker um, to prevent blasting of your potting soil and your substrates. Um, you can special order the number of holes in your breaker depending on what you want. The best tools that you can have for hand watering, of course, is a good quality water breaker. And um, you'll notice that this employee, uh, most growers um, use the old over the shoulder method and it's er because it's ergonomically um, more efficient. And almost everybody uses a, an extension wand. Because one of the things you don't want your growers to do is to reach. Um, suspended hoses, so you're not dragging the hose on the floor. Dragging the hose on the floor hooks on everything and uh, causes you to have more labor. And quick connect valves, uh, snap ins, snap off uh, valves where you're not having to, your employees not sitting there turning a turning a hose is well worth it. And um, almost everybody has gone to what's called a quarter turn valve and not a gate valve, where they're having to open and wave closes on, on and off. Now, one of the issues with a quarter turn valve in the Quick Connect system is a concept of water hammer. And you've all heard the water hammer in your apartment when the dishwasher turns on and turns off or the washing machine turns on and turns off. You hear the water, you hear the pipe shaking. You ever heard that? Okay. It's called water hammer. What happens in a big system, like a greenhouse, that water hammer, if you have 100 pounds per square inch water coming through your water line, and you hit that quarter turn valve and you snap it off, 100 pounds per square inch this way, 100 pounds per square inch going back, 200 pounds per square inch additive, pipes blow up. So most people will install what's called a um, hammer arrester. Now, all of my um, injectors that I use at Perk have what's called a hammer arrestor on because I don't it it will damage the plumbing and parts like that. For those of you at Welby Gardens, you some of you notice the chain hanging from the walls. That chain was a deflection device for pipes that erupt from water hammer. It's happened three times in the twenty years I've been here at that operation. 
a hanging chains. That's to protect somebody standing there because uh, the, the plastic pipe will actually go through the cooling pad. So, but they have hammer arresters all throughout the greenhouse. Um, one by hand, and this is one of my pet peeves of people reaching too far and spraying water, causing a sloped pot. That's a lazy waterer. When I see soil in a pot that's at a slope, that means that somebody has tried to reach too far or spray over to the next bench and they're washing the soil. And that, that's not a sellable product. And um, it just tells me that the waterers are being lazy. Um, this is a, this grower is, is a, using a, um, a mist nozzle and actually it's a homemade mist nozzle. He's got three little fine sprays and what he is doing is he's spraying and irrigating um, plugs because it needs to have that fine mist. We have two basic kinds of irrigation. We have overhead de delivery and then we have under delivery. Overhead delivery, um, sprinklers uh, mounted up high in the greenhouse uh, is pretty inefficient use of water and fertilizer because unless you've, uh, you're sprinkling um, a solid mat of uh, trays or plugs or something like that, if you're sprinkling pots, um, everything goes in between the pots is wasted. Um, you, can, you can increase that efficiency by using a catch pan or capturing the water. Uh, overhead delivery with sprinklers is going to leave the foliage wet. When the foliage stays wet, it's going to be prone to disease. Yes? That's, that was my question. It's going to be prone to disease. Anytime you have free water on your foliage, it's going to cause damage and also uh, it's going to spot your flowers. <laughs> Excuse me. So it's, it's not something that's very good for your blooming plants. So here's an example of an overhead delivery system where these uh, plants are spaced uh, one foot centers. That's a one foot, uh, one foot uh, by one foot tray and it catches the water and holds it there a little bit so it can be taken up later and it wastes less water. The other good thing about this system is it automatically, when you lay that, that mat down, it gives you automatic spacing. Um, there are all kinds of emitters out there. Um, this one in the top left hand corner is a fogger. Uh, we have spinners. Um, a lot of growers are using, going to, this is an old Netafim system, uh, not, or, or uh, it's probably the most common. Uh, Netafim is a company out of Israel. They're in the greenhouse industry and drip irrigation, they're state of the art. Uh, what's good about these particular systems is they have interchangeable parts, so you can uh, change your mist size, your droplet size, just by unscrewing and replacing those parts. Where the ones on the left are more fixed in place bronze. You can also have water contaminants. This is a greenhouse in uh, outside of uh, Corvallis, Oregon, where they have um, iron fixing bacterium in the water and an iron fixing bacterium when it comes and oxidizes in the air when it's sprinkled out uh, causes this iron oxide buildup. So you can get uh, all kinds of water contaminants. Um, other overhead irrigation systems, here's a, um, a boom irrigation system. You saw that at gully greenhouses. I think we saw that at Tagawa's maybe, they were using boom. Um, where the boom moves the nozzle over the plants. We can control this on a timer or a light accumulator, but a lot of people are now using what's called vapor pressure deficit to schedule the irrigation. Um, boom irrigation systems, there are levels of complexity. A lot of them have multi-head nozzles on them that you can just rotate and snap into different droplet sizes. Um, most of them also, you can get a, a little barcode uh, on, mounted on a magnet, you can put it on top of the the uh, the tracks in many different places to to program the system to start and stop in particular areas. Uh, also, a lot of growers are starting to mount uh, lights on their booms, especially for photoperiod control. 
and they'll take that light and they move it back and forth across the greenhouse at night to get accumulated light for, for um, uh, keeping plants vegetative. Um, the best booms, uh, both boom irrigation systems have a dual track. Uh, you can find the cheaper ones have a single track with one mount. The issue with the single track is if it gets out of balance, it, w it wobbles and it just accelerates as it goes down. So most growers are now using a double, tr a double track system. Uh, one of the major manufacturers of the boom systems is Cherry Creek and they're located in Colorado Springs. Um, these are an immense labor saving device, um, but again, uh, it's an investment in technology. There are some boom irrigation systems that are out of, actually mounted on the perimeter walls or along on the, and they're uh, heavy enough that the grower can ride on them to go out and inspect their crop. There's no walkways. So, again, you can get every level of technology you want. A basket line irrigation system, this is the echo system. Most of the basket irrigation systems we saw in uh, greenhouses this past week actually had a, a tube running above it with a trickler, a little dripper that dripped into the thing. This is an irrigation system where it's much like a um, blow wheel of a, of a ski lift and the water nozzle is actually right here. Uh, can't see the spray, but it's bringing the pot to the irrigation system. When you put in basket lines, you're essentially, uh, you can go over 100% of your square foot usage in your greenhouse. So, uh, what we call substrate surface delivery, that's when we put a little emitter on top of the soil. Drip lines, uh, these are best for, for pots. You can also use spray nozzles to spray beds. Uh, tubes, drip emitters. Um, one of the goals of a drip irrigation system is make sure you're delivering the same volume of water to each container. Um, this is the Chapin system. Um, it's basically a lead weight um, on the end of a tube and just the lead weight, the only reason it's made out of lead is because it's heavy and holds it in there. Um, this little yellow one is a stuppy system. Um, and it's basically a little, just a little piece of plastic. Um, a lot of growers I know just take polyethylene pipe and cut it into two inch sections, pop a hole in it and stick the tube in it and call it good. Um, basket stakes, um, it's hard to see in this picture, but at where it goes into the plump, the line, it's, it's, got a, it's got a labyrinth. And the goal of that little labyrinth with the trickle irrigation system is to deliver a uniform volume of water uh, based that auto automatically corrects for the water pressure. When you're um, using a drip irrigation system and you're watering it directly on the pot, one of the challenges is to make sure that you fill the surface of the pot uniformly. In other words, you have to put it on there at a rate fast enough that it fills the surface of the pot, spreads out, so you get even distribution of your water through the container. If you're only wetting a little bit, the rest of this potting soil will dry out over time and we'll get a concept called channeling. And that channeling basically cuts the volume of our pot. So if we're only putting on a little bit of water and it's just dripping a little at a time, not flooding the entire surface, it's going to create that, that channeling. And this section of the pot that's not getting water will actually dry out and be very difficult to re-wet and the roots won't even grow over there. So, so drip irrigation, um, overhead sprinklers, those are all easy to do. Um, another concept of irrigation is what we call sub-irrigation, or watering from the bottom up using capillary action. The, the beautiful thing about capillary action or, or ebb and flood technologies is that you can use them as a closed system they require half as half as much fertilizer. So we're saving fertilizer because when we do an overhead delivery, we're going to irrigate to leach. You look in your textbook, it says 10, 15% leach. 
Most growers leach 20 to 30 uh, percent. If I was a grower, I would only want my growers leaching no more than five because that's wasted water. Or if you're recapturing it. So these could be cloth systems where you recirculate, recirculate the water, but they require level benching. You have capillary mats. Also, you have problems with algae or the roots grow into the pots, something like that. The most common are ebb and flood tables with a fill pipe, uh, containment table, drain tubes. Um, when you go to a sub-irrigation system, you're definitely increasing the level of technology and level of investment. So these are ebb, ebb and flood tables here um, with a crop of uh, looks like uh, begonias or geraniums, actually. And the uh, water comes through the, the top pipe here as you see in the middle, floods the table, the water comes out at, at a rate that the table fills up and then it drains back, it drains out of the table and you, there's a gutter that runs under this line here that captures the water, goes to a water storage system and it's cleaned up, recycled and put back on the plant again. You can also use troughs, you don't have to use a whole bench. And basically a trough is just think of a rain gutter where I'm putting my plants in. A little bit sloped with the um, ebb and flood tables. They're sitting on a table and also there's potential for high humidity. We use ebb and flood technology. The flood the water is in there. The ebb is the water flows out. Um, and uh, there's not as much, but there's not as much air movement around the plant. And there is a tendency for a little bit higher humidity and the potential for some foliar diseases. With trough, irriga trough irrigation, we're just uh, having an open space, we've got a little bit of a more likelihood for some air movement around the plants. Now this trough system here is actually for cut roses, but um, you can use these trough systems just to put plants in in their containers. And we saw that at uh, Jordan's greenhouse. I don't know if you were paying attention at the time. sub irrigation can also be a flood floor, a uh, flood floor with um, uh, ebb and flood system. Uh, this is, the floors are slightly sloped. You have to have a lot of technology. So here's a picture of a diagram of a flood floor system where we have a storage tank. The water is pumped out of the storage tank into the concrete floor, floods the operation, and then it comes up through these spur lines and after the plants are irrigated, you drop the water back out. So here's another view of that ebb and flood system from a transverse view where you can see the tanks, the plants on the concrete floor. The spur line in this left uh, photograph is starting to fill and it's completely full in the middle and then they hold it for about 15 or 20 minutes. Um, it works really fast. It um, very um, not a lot of irrigation la uh, labor. One of the values behind this system or any ebb and flood system is, regardless of the size of your pot, all the plants are watered the same. With a trickle irrigation, where you put a tube on that, um, you can't mix your pot sizes. In a system like this, you can mix your pot sizes. And this particular operation, you can see that uh, these are five gallon geraniums and they got hanging baskets overhead. And this configuration, this greenhouse, they're using 125% of their floor space. The flood system is another irrigation uh, technology. It's used by uh, the Speedling Company and it's also, these are actually tobacco transplants. Um, this is a picture from a tobacco farm and the, um, the trays are styrofoam and they just float them on the water. And Speedling does the same thing with their tomato transplants in Florida. So the beautiful thing about the sub-irrigation system is you can recirculate your water, it reduces your runoff, reduces your water use, reduces your fertilizer use, because you're going to apply it at about half the rate. And it's a closed system, so you don't have a lot of water contamination. Um, 
A lot of people think of it as state of the art. It does serve to protect the environment somewhat. Uh, it does save money, uh, uh, but there is a high upfront cost. A lot of people tell me that sub-irrigation is new. This is a textbook that I have in my office from 1948, uh, 1949, um, where he's got uh, sub-irrigation systems that were designed for growing in sand beds for propagation. Uh, it's nothing that really new and novel. Uh, here's one that's based on a um, float valve. Uh, you can go to any of the, the popular growing stores and you can get all kinds of sub-irrigation technologies. The latest and the greatest that you can buy, I can build exactly the same thing with plumbing parts from Home Depot. So. With sub-irrigation though, and it, it is one of the things I want you to think about is if you get too much water in the bottom of your pot, you need to let the water drain out all the way. Because if you have a water, if you have constant water in the bottom of your pot, remember that your roots aren't going to grow all the way in because they're going to be choked out. This is one of the reasons why I recommend people to not put gravel in the bottom of their house plants because basically it just robs your soil volume. Okay unless you've got no drainage at all, because you're using a, your grandmother's fancy vase. Yes? So could you put a drip line that sits at the bottom of the pot, kind of like in heaven flu, where it fills up from the bottom instead of the, yeah, you, Can you put the drip line at the bottom of the pot where it would ebb and float up? The answer is yes, but it has to be a solid surface where, uh, or, where the, you can it's some kind of a solid containment to hold the water where the pot can drain can pull it up because it's not going to pull it up fast. You, you can put it on faster and it'll take it up. And again, here's a modified carnation beds. So, but sub irrigation is basically you have to put your plants on a watertight surface. Um, I've seen people build sub irrigation beds out of two by fours and polyethylene plastic. The critical thing is making sure you don't have standing water. You want it to be level and drain completely because it's got little puddles and pools of water. It's going to gather um, that new high nutrient fertilizer system and going to grow algae and eventually fungus gnats and other kinds of problems. But we're using the capillarity of the soil. So in other words, you need to use a fine textured mix to bring up that soil. So. If it's coarse textured, you're not going to draw it up very high, but if it's finer textured, you're going to take advantage of that capillary force to take the water up through the container. So here's a picture of a closed ebb and flood system on a watertight bench. Uh, most benches that are designed for uh, ebb and flood have, a, um, have uh, channels cut in it to drain the water away quickly. It's a picture of these petunias. They're sitting in about uh, an inch of water. Uh, this particular system took 10 minutes to fill, let it stand for 10 minutes, draws up the water, and then drain the bench. Hence the ebb and flood. Um, store it in the nutrient tank until you need it again. One of the things, the critical thing about your nutrient system, since you're using it over and over and over again, you need to make sure that you're maintaining the same electrical conductivity and balance of nutrients. I mean, sometimes you're going to have to test it periodically to see what the nutrient balance is, because sometimes plants don't take up so certain nutrients at the same rate, or it may change over time. Geraniums, for instance, can uh, they actually exude um, 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 hydroxyl groups and raise the pH of their own potting soil. You know, geraniums convert their their root zone environment. So if you're recycling it for months, you need to make sure you test it. And because most people just put water back in and then add fertilizer periodically to keep the electrical conductivity up. Um, it doesn't have to be that sophisticated. It can just be a set of pumps where you pump it up, stop the pump, and let it drain back out. It doesn't have to be that sophisticated. But the system has to be level so that it drains evenly. Um, Sanitation of your bench is important. Uh, make sure you clean the benches. A lot of these ebb and flood tables are designed to roll in the greenhouse and roll back out of the greenhouse. 
and modern systems that are coming out of Holland actually have washing machines that scrub these out, much like you would in a car wash. A lot of ebb and flood tables are usually um, two meters by nine meters, or two, me yeah. two meters, yeah, two meters by nine meters. Like I said, they don't have to be complicated. This is the system that we built at PERC. Um, it's best to use a timing system or timer of some, client, some kind. Uh, here's an old analog system. This is a newer digital system. Uh, this is just a plain and simple irrigation controller um, that, you, that you can program. I typically like to run my ebb and flood system maybe three times a day. On a cloudy day, maybe once a day. On a sunny day, maybe three to five times a day. And let my climate control computer control it. What I don't want is my employee out there filling that by hand. So, does perk look the same? Anyway, it's closed. You can use, reduce your nutrient concentration. You're never using. Um, uh, you're never letting your foliage get wet. You're using less water. You can have multiple sizes on the same bench, and it saves labor. If it's not level, you're going to have pooling water. Uh, standing water is, encourages fungus gnats and shore flies, and also another little fly called a drain fly. Um, the, the only way you can tell the difference between them and a shore fly is they have fuzzy eyes. Um, Whitney calls them sewer flies, but I call them drain flies because it sounds nicer. But they, you, you find them in the around where water accumulates. And they're expensive to install. I mean, it, it, it's an investment. Floor systems are the most uni uniform and the highest uh, value, lowest labor input. Uh, this floor is slightly sloped. And uh, most floor systems, they incorporate the heating system in the floor as well. So one of the things they do is after they drain the floor, drain the water off the floor, the heating system turns on just enough to dry out the floor quickly so we don't have a lot of water. Um, they, uh, this plastic strip along the side, a uh, rubber strip, is actually a divider between zones. Uh, they use a rubber strip so that when you roll a cart across it, it lays down. Um, these are the ultimate, they're very expensive to install. Um, Here's the injection system. Here's the storage reservoir. Water comes in and out. Water starting halfway, completely flooded. And from left to right, that's a total time of 15 minutes. This operation holds the water for 15 minutes. This green also, greenhouse also has no cooling pads and no fans. It's an open roof greenhouse. And when, when they want to cool the greenhouse down, they actually flood the floor. And this is their evaporative surface. The floor is their evaporative surface. This greenhouse is in Larkspur, Colorado. It's a long bus ride. OK. So it has to be poured to accurate specifications. This is not um, Joe Smith Concrete Company on the corner. These are pretty high-end people. Another uh, sub-irrigation system is called a capillary mat. It's been around the longest. And what it is basically is a felt mat where we put uh, irrigation or drip tubes on the, on the mat itself and put the plants on the irrigation mat. It's, it's a felt, and the contact uh, comes, the root zone comes in contact with the felt and wicks up the water through this. Yes? Run into problems with what? <clears throat> Do you get disease problems then with a wet mat all the time? In your exactly. His comment was, don't you have disease problems with this? Well, you've got this whole big mass that's wet all the time, full of nutrients all the time because it doesn't dry out very fast. And boy, it can grow a ton of algae and it can grow a ton of fungus gnats in a, in a heartbeat. So one of the things you have to do, this is uh, what, they, what they typically do, 
is they put a sheet of pla black plastic on top of that capillary mat, cut little discs in the hole in the in the capillary in the plastic itself, and the pot then is set on that little hole. This is the ideal production system for gloxinias and African violets. Anybody grow African violets? Okay, you water them from with a with a piece of yarn maybe. That, just have them in a cup. In a cup. Uh, a lot of a lot of the real hardcore hobby growers will use a piece of big piece of knitting yarn and and dangle that into a pot and let it wick up through the yarn because uh, African violets do not want to have their leaves wet at any time it causes spotting. So the capillary mat for uh, African violets is a standard production practice. Also for gloxinias, uh, exocum. Um, several other species. But again, it can be a closed system, reduce your nutrient use. Um, what a lot of growers will do is um, they'll actually, um, at the end of the bench, they'll, they'll drape that capillary mat off the edge and put a trough under because the water will wick through the mat and drip off the edge to, to pull water through. Um, capillary mats have been around for since 50s and 60s, I think. Again, these are more likely to have algae problem, uh, fungus net buildup. Uh, this is a picture of the trough culture. Uh, the trough culture, uh, this is actually from Holt Camps from Nashville. I think we saw a movie video earlier in the semester. And that is that they put their African violets in the trough and they just run water through the trough don't have a very good photograph of that. What's the different about the trough culture is we're taking advantage of that ebb and flood technology, much like you would in the um, with the the ebb and flood tables. However, with the troughs you have open aeration, you have more airflow, more air circulation, so there's less disease. Troughs have to be watertight. You're restricted to your container size because your container's got to fit in the trough, and uh, you need to make sure it's it's at the right flow rate. And again, I've already showed you this picture before the float system. Sanitation is important with all these systems. Anytime you're recirculating your water, you need to sanitize your water. Uh, either UV light, UVC radiation. We've already talked about this. Ozonation or chlorination. UV is a, this is a UVC lamp, 8,000 8, watt lamp, uh, sanitizing the water. Uh, filtration, this is a, called a, a cascade filter. Uh, what's good about the cascade filter is the little, um, this um, slope where the water flows across, it's got little pins, and the little pins catch the uh, peat moss, the dirt and debris. And what's easy about this is just to clean it. It has a special comb that you just wipe through it, throw it away. These are multimedia filters on um, the right where there are levels of garnet, sand, and uh, activated charcoal. And this filtration system is bringing lake water into this greenhouse. Um, or you could use the same system for recycling your water. Um, most people that recycle also have inline pH meters and EC meters to monitor their nutrient solutions, hook it to the computer. Um, you've got to store it. One of the things that this particular greenhouse discovered when they started storing their water, they brought EPA in, was touring their facility, and they were really proud to show them how much water they were saving, how much fertilizer they were saving, and all these sorts of things. And they discovered EPA discovered, told them that since you're capturing this water and it's fertilizer, it's now a point source pollution risk. And the next thing you had to do is build concrete bunkers, much like a, around a diesel fuel tank. So You have to have wellhead protection with your water systems. This is a backflow uh, prevention device. Um, if you're using city water or even any municipal water, you have to have backflow prevention systems to make sure you're Fertilizer solutions don't go back into the to the municipal water or, or into your neighbor's water system. Um, about the only time you're going to get backflow from your greenhouse into the municipal water system is if some joker down the road 
cut a water line and drop the pressure and suck the water back out of your property into the city water. It's usually rarely your mistake, but you're still you're still required to have the black flow prevention system. Another technology is called pulse irrigation. Pulse irrigation is a uh, another technology that's been used by a couple of growers where they're irrigating just in little squirts. Where early on I showed you about if you don't spread your water out, you get that uniform flow. But if you put out like a 15 second burst of water over an hour, just enough to saturate the soil but not leach through, um, you can get the same effect that you got with the ebb and flood technology and you're actually watering to what's called zero leach. Again, pulse irrigation technology, you, you have to cut your, your recommended fertilizer rate by at least 50%, at least 50%, or you get a high buildup of salts.